Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, and I think all of us at NIH are midwives in some way um, on the research that goes on um, at the NIH. Um, I think Claudia did a really nice job this morning kind of laying the groundwork for the Precision Medicine Initiative and the overall sort of concept of it at the 30,000 foot level in the context in which it's going to be um, discussed. Kathy Hudson tomorrow is gonna discuss precision medicine in much more detail. I'm gonna spend my time today talking about precision medicine initiative from a social and behavioral sort of perspective. And the things that we think are important, kind of following up from Nancy and Jody both, about the ways in which we can incorporate social and behavioral factors more in our understanding of health um, and the integration of that with genomics and other data. So, as all of you know, well, almost a year and a half now, um, the president announced the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, at the same time, uh, Dr. Collins and Dr. Varmus, who was the NCI director at the time, um, put out this article about um, sort of our vision for the Precision Medicine Initiative. And it was actually quite broad. It talked about not only genomic data, electronic health record data, um, and clinical data, but also lifestyle data, environmental data, social data as well, and the influence of all of those in understanding those better in improving health. Not everyone in the public health and population health arena, however, was quite so excited. Um, Sandro, who I respect a lot, um, had this article um, that we worry that the unstinting focus on precision medicine is a mistake and a distraction from the goal of producing a healthier population. Uh, the fact that Stanford actually has focused its big data effort not on precision medicine, on precision health today, I think is one example of how we actually are focusing much bigger and broader than that. Um, so we actually wrote um, an article, actually in parallel, I didn't realize that Sandro's article was coming out about the same time, but we wrote an article to talk about what are some of the behavioral and social factors that are important in the precision medicine initiative. And one of the key things that we said was that it's more than genes and drugs and disease. Right, that there are many more factors involved in this, and that it's very reasonable to hypothesize that there are also differential treatment responses that are available from the exposome, right? They're available from the social and environmental influences that people experience throughout their lives. Um, and then there was another article that Mu and Corey led um, that talked about more of a precision public health sort of perspective, that we can think about precision medicine, again, from a public health perspective, and I'll talk about some of the details of that in a minute. Um, this is, um, Nancy's slides were actually built much more nicely than this. This is from Glass and McAtee in 2006, but it's the same concept, right? That there is both factors and influences of health that are below the waterline, but there are also um, influences of health that are above the waterline. And those both interact with each other on a regular basis. To treat these as separate but equal did not work in the civil rights era. It doesn't work when we're looking at precision medicine either. That these have to be integrated. We have to think about the way in which social and behavioral factors are the embodiment, directly affect some of these um, under the water or un inside the skin sort of functions. We also have to be able to think about how those interact to influence behavior, which then ultimately influences health as well. And that that happens over a life course. This is not a static phenomena. This is something that's influenced from before the time of birth all the way through death. Um, and understanding that life course better is gonna be an important component of this. I could show many slides, and um, some people before me have showed slides like this, and I think it's just important to recognize this is just one example of many in which um, the social and behavioral factors have been important in us actually changing population health. This is data from the SEER database that shows how much we've bent the curve in colorectal cancer incidents over the last few decades. And that comes from two major factors. One is that we've done a better job on risk factors, smoking, diet, physical activity, fiber, those sorts of things. And we've also done a much better job on screening behaviors, right? Not only the fact that we have those screening processes in place, but that we also can encourage people to actually um, engage in those screening behaviors. And that's bent the curve over the last few months. Um, another example, just quickly off the top of my head, um, most of you may know that when we put indoor smoking bans into any community or state or country, um, we usually see about a 15% reduction in hospitalizations for MI. We see it consistently over and over and over again. And even in one situation, we saw it where um, one county actually changed its mind. It put the smoking ban in, it took it off, it put it back in, and we saw the very nice reversal design of the effects of that um, on MIs and hospitalizations. So we have to think in precision medicine about something broader than that. Now, now in behavioral interventions, we've been doing sort of personalized medicine or tailored interventions for some period of time. 
But there's additional complexities on behavioral sort of interventions that I think are important to consider. We're not just thinking about for whom, which is the tailored or personalized question, right? The, the precision question. But it's also important to recognize that we also have to think about in what context these things occur. That the same intervention that didn't work for a person at time one might work for them in time two because the experience between those times has been an influence, the motivations have changed, the context in which the intervention is delivered has changed. So we've got time factors that go on as well. And as a result, we have to use methodologies like just-in-time um, adaptive interventions, ecological momentary assessment interventions, interventions to be able to do that sort of work. And then we also have to think about in what combination sequence, because we don't usually have one active ingredient in most behavioral interventions, we have multiple ones. And so we have to understand in what combinations can those be optimized, which sequences should we actually put those in, and whether those sequences and combinations should be different for different people. Um, so the complexity actually gets um, pretty significant pretty quickly. But that to achieve this, we really need very reliable and intensive longitudinal data, which is where the big data effort comes in. So I'm just gonna step back for a second and remind you that all of our methods, for the most part, were developed during a time where we were in a data-poor research environment, right? Um, the priority was on prospective design, data collection. We had very limited data collection opportunities, so we came up with an idea, we came up with a hypothesis, we collected the data to do that, and the study design to do it. We did that study, and then we threw away the data, right? That was, that's been our model for many, many years. It resulted in the fact that most of our work was predominantly cross-sectional or it was minimally longitudinal, pre, post, follow-up types of things. And we were unable to assess most of the confounds and so we controlled them by a randomization. So we did lots of randomized control trials to be able to get at that a little more closely. I want us to think for a second what life would look like in a data-rich environment. And there are a few examples, right? Meteorology is a data-rich environment, uh, plate tectonics and geology, the Hadron Super Collider, cosmology as well. All these things have in common that they built a large research infrastructure. They put something in place to collect a large amount of data that was temporally dense, that they could do computational models on, and that their focus was on trying to predict, right? Explain and predict, in this case, behavior, health, those sorts of things. Um, so I just wanna remind us what the meteorology folks did. And I, as you do this, as I do this, Think for a minute about how we currently have our national surveillance system, right? Meteorology has this wonderful international surveillance system in place to be able to monitor things on a regular basis and be able to predict the weather for us. They allow us to be able, and they have saved lives as a result of that. I suspect if we had the same national and international surveillance system that was that integrated for health, we would save many more lives than we currently are able to save. Um, but they started with limited local measurement, just like we do with every hospital and every EHR being different and fragmented and separate from everybody else. They leveraged their communication technologies, which at the time was the telegraph. We are in a little better shape today than we were then, to actually share that data back and forth among all the various sites and all the various places where they're collecting data. They set standards for data integration, which we still have yet to do. We have done it in pockets and places, but we still have a ways to go with that. They continued to leverage the technical advances in measurement and communication, and that resulted in this rich, integrated, computationally focused model data to explain and predict phenomena. So the question is, could we do that in a data-rich science? Right? Um, in behavioral science, we're, I, I think we're on the verge. I've, I've said many times that this is probably one of the more exciting times to be a graduate student in the behavioral and social sciences because the world is changing, it's changing quickly, and the methods and data that I had available to me are far inferior to what we currently have available and that's coming down the road. Our ecological momentary assessment capabilities allow us to deliver all types of random queries to people and even event-based queries on cell phones. Uh, we can capture digital traces, what uh, Sandy Pentland calls digital breadcrumbs, that we just sort of scatter throughout our day, not only from social media, but also just from our interactions with um, search engines and our car and all the other things that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the explosion and passive sensor technology, so that we have sensor technologies now for mo pretty much all of the major health risk behaviors that are available to us and that we're concerned about, as well as many other things beyond that. And being able to leverage that technology and use that sensor data to develop this temporally dense data set is really gonna be important for us. And that temporal density is critical for a number of reasons. So 
This is the Framingham Heart Study and the social network analyses that were done on obesity and happiness, right? Just sort of large computational data sets. And we need to move beyond that to being able to think now more about those social network models and how they change longitudinally over time, and also how in a precision medicine sort of model, those might be slightly different for people who are at the fringes of that network than the people who are in the middle of the nodes. Um, we've used it for taxes um, and for um, being able to model tobacco taxes and smoking prevalence. Our concern here, if we're thinking about precision medicine, this is agent-based modeling sorts of approaches. Um, but our consideration here in precision medicine is do those tax things, do the policy things that Jody were talking about, do those influence all people the same or do they impact different people differentially? And we have to think about in which ways do we need to augment some of these policy changes with some more on the ground changes to make that happen. Um, and then finally, we can actually leverage sort of control system models to begin to think about how do people change be over time and how does the behavior change over time and what influences that? And can we think of these model predictive control controllers as essentially being intervention components that we're trying to address? So in PMI, um, it's a million plus volunteers. What I've tried to describe to you is actually bigger than that. As audacious as a million volunteers is, um, a real national, um, surveillance system for health would actually be 200 million people, right? We'll start with a million, right? That's small, that's okay. We'll get that as a beginning. Um, and health provider organizations will be one of the primary ways that we'll get those participants, but they'll also come from direct volunteers. The president was very clear, so anyone should be able to raise their hand, say, I wanna be a precision medicine participant, and you should be able to do that. Um, that they're centrally involved in the design and implementation, and they're able to do donate samples and receive regular feedback on that data as they move forward. So that we can forge this sort of new model in which participants are actually much more involved in the process, and their data is much more their responsibility and under their control. So we have patient partnerships, we have EHRs, um, the technology component and being able to leverage that as much as possible, all the genomic data, and then the data science piece to be able to integrate that to have a real precision medicine initiative that allows us to understand health better, not only at the genomic level, but also at the social and environmental levels as well. So thank you. Mm.